<clears throat> Shannon Adams will be joining us tonight from her home in Seattle to present Courtin Areas 101, an entry-level introduction. Originally from Australia, Shannon came to the States 20 plus years ago and was quickly bitten by the Courtin Areas bug. She loves the diversity and beauty of this very complicated species. Shannon's interest is in the taxonomy of the species, which she has been collecting and documenting for six years and has over 1,200 collections in her private herbarium. In 2021, she published the paper for the new species, Cortinarius uh, rufosanguineus, and maybe Shannon will give us the correct pronunciation later. Her interest isn't strictly academic, however, as she recently enjoyed a morel and nettle frittata with nettle pot pesto and black trumpet risotto. So uh, yay, Shannon. Uh, to further the understanding of the species, she asks that we participate in mycota and mycoflora uh, events to sequence more cortinarius specimens. Welcome, Shannon. Thank you so much, Mike. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me. Um, it's a pleasure to be with, uh, with the club today. Um, also, welcome to, to a few of my uh, friends from the uh, Pacific Northwest Key Council. We, we had a weekend together, and it's really nice to see your faces. Um, I'm glad you could join us. I see Paul waving from the front screen. Let me just share my screen and get started. So um, the, the, the title of, of this talk, um, Portinarius 101, is a, a slight um, nod to a lot of the bad reputation that Cortinarius has had, um, particularly among amateurs and people trying to do field mycology. It, it's typically been a genus that's been considered too hard. So I'm really keen today to start off um, and address whatever level you're at with Cortinarius. This is not a talk only for experts, although I hope that people interested in taxonomy will find something um, to please you as well. So, so what I'm going to cover, I'm going to talk just generally about what is a Cortinarius. Um, obviously, I can't do Cortinarius 101 without starting with, with the basics. And then I'm going to look at three different approaches to how you can move further in ports. First, maybe if you're someone who's interested in those morel frittatas, let's look at edibility. Why might you want to identify Cortinarius or understand them better if you're mainly hunting edibles? And secondly, for people who might be interested in more field identification, I'll go into that when I reach it. And finally, I'm going to give you a scan, just a taste of some of the big developments in Cortinarius taxonomy that are happening right now. And then I'll probably leave you with a few resources and maybe tempt you to go a bit further and continue on this journey. So first, like, what, what is a Cortinarius? The, the family, um, so Cortinarius is a genus. It's the only genus in the family Cortinariaceae. Um, there is a, another group that's positioned there called Stephanopus. Um, that's with North of Vegas, Southern Hemisphere, but it hasn't got genetic data. So its placement isn't as yet certain. But even with a single genus in the Cortinariaceae, we have thousands of species. Um, I've seen the estimates from you know, three, four, 5,000 plus globally and already 3,000 sequence concepts. That means genetic barcodes showing proof that the species exists are in genetic databases. So I suppose the short answer here is a Cortinarius is in a very abundant genus. The, the original type, the first species described that is the type of this, this genus is Agaricus violaceus. And it was described in 1753 by no other than Linnaeus. But like, how do you actually recognize one with such an abundance? So the, the, the name Cortinarius comes from the word cortina or veil, curtain, and the most commonly described, you look at a book, the place they'll start you is, oh, Cortinarius have a cortina. So for years, I was really confused about what a cortina was. I thought it was only the case when you had this kind of cobwebby, um, thread-like veil or, or, or threads that connect the edge of the, the cap and to the stipe. And pretty much I was looking for those. You can see they could be silky, they could be heavier, and often they have these sort of little brown dots on them, which is the spore deposit as it falls down. But in fact, when you look at the cortina, there can be two parts. Many, many cortinarias have two cortinas. They have this one universal veil that covers the entire fruit body when young, 
And it can also have this inner cortina. So we're just going to look at a few examples of that because it's never really been described to me well outside of a few very specialist books. So here you're seeing, look at this example on the left. These fine thready um, threads that you're seeing on the left is the partial veil of cortina. And the, some, sometimes you'll see that entire uh, fruit body could be cased. There's another fibrous outer veil. It could also be that the entire fruit body, as in this case, is surrounded by a universal veil of, of, um, of hyphen veil material. But of course, and can't be simple and quaternarius, these veils are not always visible. So don't exclude something from being a quaternarius just because it hasn't got that cortina or veil. Um, other very important characteristics, because quaternarius are not the only uh, mushrooms that have veils, uh, but you need to look to the fact that they are growing on the ground. They will not be growing on wood. Um, and they um, are, are very widespread. They could, you know, they could be growing in lots of different habitats, but often on moss, mossy conditions, and very rarely sort of on very decomposed wood. So uh, they can go all around the world and aren't limited to any one particular continent. These two examples here are both mushrooms you will see in California. The one on the left is Portinarius salo, and when I write AFF, it means that this actual species isn't being described, but it needs work. And this particular species is probably related to the European sailor. It hasn't got a, a local name. So, you know, I gave you very little tease. So, Cortinarius, they have these cortinas, the rusty brown spores that you'll see falling on the cortinas, they're growing on the ground. But look how varied they are. And, you know, if you were trying to tell somebody how to find a Cortinarius, where would you start with this much variation? And how do we even decide how to get further? And to be honest, this has stumped me for a long time because I'd start by looking at the big purple ones. You know, that's what catches your eye when you're first walking. And you may not notice some of the, you know, the morphological variety. So really, how do we get started if we're talking about the real one-on-one beginner entry level? So once again, as I said, let's talk about why. Because if you were just interested in eating mushrooms, you don't need to go and understand the complete taxonomy of a genus with possibly 5,000 species, right? You've probably got other priorities and recipe books. But maybe if you are interested in becoming a real whole naturalist in your area, more holistic naturalist, you might want to understand what's in your area, in which case we can take a different approach. So I'm going to start with this perspective from someone who might want to eat mushrooms. And then we'll build on that. And hopefully you'll pick your own level and, and we can have that conversation from there. So firstly, when you want to eat mushrooms, what do you start with? Um, the, I find sort of three needs, or I, I'm a researcher, so I think of them as use cases. The first one, I want to know which cotton areas I can eat. And unfortunately, I've got some bad news for you that they're not very many. But an important thing is also to be able to separate cotton areas from edible mushrooms that you might be able to eat. So we'll look at a few of those. And finally, obviously, you want to avoid eating anything that could really kill you or hurt you. So we'll look at some poisonous uh, mushrooms in this genes. Okay, so I have a funny story is when I was down in Santa Cruz at one of the Santa Cruz um, microflora forays that Christian and Noah organized, there was a, a conversation that maybe we could eat purple cordonarius because people have been eating purple mushrooms for a long time and no one was sick. As it happens, this purple cordonarius is edible. It, it can be eaten. Um, it's called Cortinarius violaceus, and as I mentioned, it's uh, the type of species for Cortinarius. People describe it as tasting muddy. Some people say it tastes a bit dank. Um, but, you know, for, for someone who wants to have a checklist of all the mushrooms that they've eaten in the world, this one is certainly an option. Does it work? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I'm not sure if there was a question there, but maybe. Yeah, so on this, you're looking here at the cap, you can see it's really tomentose or, or hairy, it's kind of tufted. So this one is a pretty easy beginner's mushroom because we have very few things that are completely purple like this and um, have this kind of uh, really fibrous tomentose you know, pileus. So hopefully many of you have seen this mushroom. I would not recommend you go out and harvest it because it often occurs in you know, older forest. It's not abundant, um, but it is an interesting one because often is described as something you can just reminding you, how do you identify a Cortinarius? You've got the Cortina, 
um, you have this, you can see this little remnants of Cortina on the edge there, and it's got that rusty brown look. Why? Because the spores are, are dropping and they've been caught in the cobwebs, much as sort of dew drops in a spider web. And that's one of the big tips. If you're looking at an eye naturalist and you're wanting to say, is something important areas, look for these little fibrils with this really a rusty brown um, spore deposit. And it's a really good tip that it's not something that, say, might be a white spore. You can see again at the top of the slide. Uh, the most common, if you're looking in field guides, things you can eat, uh, the most commonly eaten cortinarius is cortinarius caporatus. And you can see all of these examples here are cortinarius caporatus. It's not a beginner's mushroom, which is why, you know, because it can be mistaken for things that, that are not edible or are not known to be safe to eat. But let's look at the characteristics, because I know there are a number of identifiers and people in our clubs who do eat this mushroom when it, when it fruits. So number one, it's got a wrinkled cap. You'll see it sometimes called the gypsy mushroom or the wrinkled court. And that refers to this kind of corrugation in the cap, folded kind of layers you'll see in the photograph on the extreme right. It sometimes has a powdery white coating and it has the most important feature, a felty annulus. It reminds me more of an agaricus annulus than of a cortinarius, um, which makes it quite unique. And it in fact has been described as a separate genus um, in the past. Let's look at a few examples. And uh, this one is my photograph. But look at the, on the left, it's a really unique kind of thick felty annulus along with the, the spore print, the rusty brown. You know that you're seeing something that maybe could be differentiated enough to eat. Um, and, and even though the gills are pale, don't be mistaken, this is still the rusty brown spore print will, will um, occur if it's mature. Also, a zigzag pattern on the upper side can be very reassuring. Um, and again, just some examples from iNaturalist. Uh, I often go to iNaturalist and sort of just browse my way around there and do some identification because it's a really good way to check your concept of what a mushroom is. In this case, it was correctly labeled Cortinarius caparatus. Um, annulus is clear, a powdery cap, a little bit of wrinkling. Here's another one. Hopefully, if I was in the room with you, I might do a pop quiz and say who can, who can identify the features here. But hopefully, we're all looking again at that annulus, the slightly zigzag chevrons above the annulus, and that little bit of a wavy margin on the cap. Oddly, when I, I tasted this mushroom, I tasted a bit like petrochemicals to me. So I have not been a big advocate of it, but I know not everyone has that. <laughs> and then this one, this one was also labeled Cotinarius caporatus, but it, it is not. And if you look at it, what's missing is the annulus. It, it, you know, if you were in, in person, you could actually look at it, you could turn it around, you'd see more of these features. But certainly the lack of annulus is a big red flag. And I wouldn't recommend you eat it, even if the annulus is just washed off, unless you're very confident in the idea. And in this Cortinarius caporatus, um, when I zoom in on that one, it's got a vulva. And so this is certainly not Cortinarius caporatus, but possibly the person or the AI got fooled by the sulcate margin and mistook that for the corrugated margin. So we always have to be a little alert and not rely on these sort of IDs that you're seeing on the platform until we get a little more validated um, ideas. Nope, no, no. But this process of eliminating things um, is another really important skill if you're gonna be eating mushrooms, particularly looking at pulps. So, I mean, most of us, if you're collecting uh, chanterelles, you'd have learned to eliminate hygrophoropsis. I can still remember the day I had a hygrophoropsis and a chanterelle and I was like, which is which? So I certainly feel for people who are starting out on that journey. There's just a, a lot of information for you to learn to identify until it becomes easy. So in the Cortinarius area, one of the most common lookalikes is the Clytosabe nuda being mistaken for purple Cortinarius. I see this every season multiple times. Uh, people come and think they've got a, a Clytosabe nuda or blew it, and instead are actually um, putting in their, filling their basket with purple Cortinarius. So how might you tell the difference? In this case, Cortinarius olympianus is a rare mushroom, so it's unlikely that you're going to see it in the same habitat, and it's often an old growth. If you put KOH on it, it would go bright pink. Most of us aren't carrying those kind of chemicals around. Um, most important is the spore print. So if you look at those fibrils, those Cortina remnants, remember from earlier on, 
You're seeing them at the top of the slide, and you'll notice that rusty brown spore deposit. And um, there are dozens of times I just pointed out to someone in the photograph they've mailed me, look at the spore, look at the rusty brown spore deposit. No, this is not a dwarf. So if you can kind of just remember that, check for the spore deposit in these purplish mushrooms, you'll save yourself um, a lot of ID trouble. Pinkish, rusty brown. Another common one, I mean, you wouldn't think that people would mistake this Cortinarius trigenus for a Tytosa benuda, particularly because trigenus is a really unique of these purple mushrooms in that it always has a rusty brown young gill color. Um, so, I mean, I'm probably just saying words, words at you if you haven't tried to identify trigenus, but it's a really nice mushroom to learn. And I'd encourage everyone to make this one of the 10 Cortinarius that you can ID uh, yourself with confidence. What you're looking for with this Cortinarius is whenever you slice it in half, you'll see that the flesh itself is this brown spotted motley color, rusty brown. And the young girl, while many mushrooms would be bright purple or, or grayish purple, is this rusty brown color, even in the button bone. Compared to Plactasa benuda, where you've got the whitish or colored gills, it's a very easy mushroom to become cute. But you know, this gets complicated, right? I understand why people have considered courts difficult because in this picture, you're seeing four different purple species. And I'm just gonna give you a moment, look across here and see if you could pick them out. Um, I wish I could give you all little pointers and you can all wave. But generally, when I ask people to do this, that you're probably seeing on the right, the Cortinarius trigenus, because I've just shown it to you. And in the middle, look, there's a species that has purple young girls. So that's a clue that you've got something different there. And then on the left, the one that's at the front has the pale girls and is more silvery. That's a different species. It's Cortinarius AFF sailor. And at the back, you've got um, a totally different one of the purple recenti, uh, Cortinarius occidentalis. So you can imagine when somebody's going in the forest with a limited concept of what these mushrooms are, this kind of profusion of purpleness can be a really difficult challenge. And so that's why it's important to start just observing the different parts of the mushroom and getting your bearings. One, two, three, four. But you can also smell them. Cortinarius, uh, I know Christian's been talking um, about mushroom odor um, as an important identification feature recently. Courts are good for this. If you were smelling these four specimens, you'd have a really strong goatee odor from the one in the center, Cortinarius camphoratus. And you might smell pears or a fruity odor from the one on the right. So I'm often going around licking, nibbling, spitting, and sniffing mushrooms. And I think that that's a really important experiential part that builds up our sort of memory of these species. But just to call out, I'm not gonna teach ID on these, but be aware that there are some very poisonous sporting areas. And I know there are people who like to sort of checklist and experiment with mushrooms. You know, there are people who have eaten more sporting areas than the ones I've mentioned. But avoid those that might contain aurelini. Um, these are all the Cortinarius rubellus. I've only seen them on the East Coast um, and, and Central. Um, and it is a fluorescent, uh, th that actual uh, chemical is fluorescent. So many of these mushrooms have some reaction. Uh, here, for example, is aurelinus and aurelinosis. Um, which are mainly occurring with oak trees, but you know they could occur in our area. So just calling out that these kinds of mushrooms are important to avoid, and there have been some deaths um, resulting from renal failure, which is not immediate. This is not something you even feel a bit sick and throw up. It can take weeks um, for the damage to be done. So you know this is a reason why a lot of clubs say just don't eat cortinarius. Uh, I think that you certainly can learn to eat uh, a few of them. So and maybe you, you, you are going beyond just what you can eat in the pot. You're like, Shannon, I didn't come here just to eat. I'm beyond that. I actually want to build on my understanding of what occurs in my area. And it's really common when you go beyond you. You know how to find your chanterelle patch. You, you're familiar with the seasons and, and what comes up. You start to look elsewhere on the table. Uh, this is an example of the, uh, my local club, the Puget Sound Mycological Society's table. It was not a very um, abundant season, but you can see we're getting a lot of stuff. And beyond what I can eat it, the next question we ask is, what is this cool thing? And I started to do that. I started to draw quotes, and I was routinely told, sorry, we don't put names in quoting areas. 
I was told only Dr. Joan Moradi puts names on Fortinarius and he's not here right now. Um, and this actually, I, I, I'm embarrassed to say I accepted that answer for a good five years. But after that, I started to push with help, um, including from people like Demetar's work in California, Noah, and from having so many um, Fortinarius species in the mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, and really learning how to find academic papers where species are described. I started to build on that and put names on the species in my area. So, you know, why not is the question. And I put that question to you, especially with genetic data. Why don't we put more names on cotton names? But let's get started. Firstly, we don't know how many courts exist in California. So you can be blamed for, you cannot be blamed for asking, you know, what is the challenge? How, what is the list that I should be checking off? This is not like eBird, where you can look and see um, everything that exists and sort of make progress. If you look at mushrooms of the Redwood Coast, I think 102 species are mentioned. Uh, that would be photographs of salmon and additional related species. If we looked at iNaturalist, we have 167 species concept used rightly or wrongly. Um, Danny Miller and Ian Gibson are building up genetic um, data sets for the Pacific Northwest, including California, and they have over 400 cotton areas. Um, myself and other researchers and courts have been contributing. So what's the number? Um, personally, I think that because so many of my species are the first record in genetic databases, I think more than 10%, uh, 20% of those I collected in spring um, in Southern California we knew, I think the number is north of 400. Uh, so there's a big list. So how, how do you approach such a, a, a challenge? I, I recommend that you think of two techniques to identify faults. Number one, you're going to look for distinctive species. Um, distinctive species are things that have notable features, you know, a, a strong smell, a bitter taste, a splendid color, or just is very different to other species. Also, it needs to be something that you see relatively often so you can practice and remember. Um, imagine the species you put in a set of flashcards. Uh, so what are those notable species? Then also things you just like for some reason. And you know, every club meeting, there's somebody who falls in love with tiny little, tiny little things you can't see. There's people who just love the leads. It's a visceral thing. So, you know, honor your passions. Um, if there's some species that just jump out to you, learn their names and start to socialize them. But that only takes you so far. And honestly, most of our memories start to fail us after a bit. So it's also important to use the approach of groups. Uh, groups with similar characteristics. Uh, I used to, when I first joined clubs and started to ID court, see this done all the time. People would talk about mixacium, telemonia, barbopodium. But we started to hear rumors, you know, in the last decade that these were not founded on natural lineages. That means that these weren't actually sort of based in genomic or taxonomic uh, data. And so people stopped using those, those groups. But I certainly find them immensely useful. And even if they're not, some of these may not be based on um, you know, natural lineage or defined completely um, in that way. I still find them immensely useful for teaching the characteristics of groups of cotton areas that gets us really close to ID. So imagine like you're looking in a bird book, it's like getting to the hawks, but maybe some of the hawks actually don't fit in there familiarly, but still it helps you get to the right set of the book where you'll find the bird that you've just seen. That's the idea with groups. Just uh, an example, this um, comes from um, an example of uh, by uh, in uh, Mixacium done by Michelle um, and Michelle Seidel. And what she's looking at here are the different subgeneric classifications used in courts. So what I'm showing you is just to show that these groups vary. It's not like there's one way of dividing up court areas. So you can divide up and use the which that's helpful to you. You can see I, the Mosia had many more. Um, we had Kaufman with fewer, and yet there were some that were consistently used for a fairly long time. I think um, Moshe was from 1980s. So now we're going to look at the top 10 most observed species of Cortinarius in California using those two techniques. Let's look for really notable species that we think we can remember and groups that we can start to recognize and at least say, I saw a mixacium. Oh, that looks like a demosity. So um, just looking at this, this was I pulled yesterday. It's the whole of California, apologies. It's not just Northern California. 
hopefully these are recognizable to me. So number one, I'm giving it to you a third time. Hopefully everybody here will be a trigenus expert by the end of it. Uh, this is a very bright purple mushroom, can fade a bit, but it's important that it's heavily veiled with this beautiful purple um, universal veil. And it also has these brown young gills and the, the rusty brown flesh in section. You chop out of purple cortinarius apart, and I encourage you to do this. I've spent a long time slicing courts. You'll see it's very clear on, on reflection that you've got a trigenus if it's these, has those characteristics um, versus, say, um, and not one of the other uh, purple species, some fetidus or, or whatever's in your area if you don't. Um, another really memorable court, I, I would love a show of hands here, who's seen this one? But it's the largest court in, in the California area. It's um, Cortinarius ponderosus. So the cap can be up to 40 centimeters. I think I took a photograph of um, Terry Hinkle last year posing this. You know, it's, it's a real chunker. Uh, it also has this beautiful brown, scaly kind of gluten as it dries, which makes it quite distinctive. And the gray purple gills. Uh, apparently, some people, some of you guys eat this thing. I have not. Um, it's supposed to have mixed mixed reactions. Somebody wrote, I think, that they should try it in broth. And again, just to look at the Cortinarius features, in the bottom, you're seeing the Cortina, the partial veil, and you're seeing the rusty brown spore point, which should fill you with a lot of confidence. Um, it's not going to get you all the way, but it certainly will eliminate a lot of the pale spore generally. So Cortinarius ponderosus. Um, and we'll talk about maybe some taxonomic shifts affecting this mushroom later. So just bookmark that thought. So back to the beginning, we've got Cortinarius trigenus, memorable species, Cortinarius ponderosus, very large, ponderous, huge, um, memorable species, and then we've got a group. So all of these species are somewhat related by these two characteristics. They have a viscid cap. You can see how slimy they are. And they also have a viscid stipe. So if you wanted to run your fingers down the stipe, you'll feel like a jelly-like, slimy mucus that can be really abundant and thick in rainy weather. Um, and even in dry weather, you'll feel this kind of tackiness um, for the, the girdling the stipe. These in the past used to be called mixacea. And I would still encourage you to think of that idea. If it's viscid cap, viscid stipe, it's a group called mixa the mixacea. And then within that, we found that there are actually a lot of different related uh, groups of taxa that are more closely related, but I won't digress into those subgroups. But imagine you're looking through your book of mushrooms. If you go and look at Court Ideal, you look them up on a website, by going to mixacioid, uh, those with mixacioid features, you're already in a short list of less than 20 species if you're in our area. So um, it's, a, it's a really good technique. The most memorable one in your area, is Cortinarius glutinosa amelitis. And it's probably familiar to many of you. It has a slimy cap and stipe. And in this case, it has remarkable belts of slime, which I've only uh, ever seen in another species called Trivialis, which is common in Alaska, um, some, some areas of the Pacific Northwest. But these beautiful slimy girdles with the cap, the large size, and these grayish purple gills make this a really memorable mixacioid or mixacean-like um, species. So that would be a useful technique next time you feel the, find one of these very viscid ports, viscid stipe, with our beautiful um, cortina and the, the spore deposit, you can be pretty certain um, that you have cortinarius glutinosa amelitis. There are two other really commonly observed, in that top 10 in California, two other mixacioid names, mixacean names. Cortinarius sidelii and Cortinarius van Duzerensis. In fact, I, I asked Noah yesterday, well, what do you thought about Cortinarius van Duzerensis? Because that's a name that's very widely used, but I've actually never had a sequence collection match that type. In other words, everything that I find that sort of looks like it could be Cortinarius van Duzerensis turns out to be sidelii. Um, and his opinion was that, in fact, almost everything, well, probably everything we're collecting is actually Cortinarius sidelii until proven otherwise. So this is an interesting one. If you want to go on the, uh, the genetic hunt, um, collect around the type location for Cortinarius van duzerensis and see if you can get us a photograph collection. Um, the challenges aren't there. 
So that puts so just reminding Mixacean, we've got the three names that we're using, the Fortinarius glutinosa armillatus, um, Cydelia, probably the most common, and then we have Vanduzarensis. There are probably others, but those are the three that, that are most common. And here's another group. This is the group that I'm um, quite passionate about at the moment. <coughs> it's often called Fortinarius crocius when people find it in our area. Um, and it's also known as Fortinarius thiersii. Um, a little bit more of a spring species. These are all called dermosibi. Dermosibi have a fiber, fibrous cap. Derm means skin head. So it's dermosibi, skin head. And uh, these dermosibi are known to have really beautifully bright gills, this furry head, um, and often with quite brightly bright veils. So you'll see on the left there that the, the veil or protein is quite yellow. It's got the beautiful yellow. And if you put KOH, the chemical potassium hydroxide on these, they often have a really bright purple magenta vinaceous reaction, which can be um, important for ID. And they can also have UV reactions, which can also help you with ID. So you might want to be carrying the Portinarius toolkit um, with some chemicals um, and a little UV light, about 365 um, wavelength to test uh, those characteristics as well. There's so much to learn with Demosity. They um, have a large number of cryptic species or species that look alike. So we're simply not even tipping the, uh, measuring the tip of the iceberg in terms of the names that we're using for uh, Demosibi right now. All of these three came back with recent sequencing as um, affiliated with one particular group, the Malacorius group. Um, I don't have names for them. I'm not sure how to get there with them. But what you're seeing in all these three is they have this orange cap it's kind of blacky, almost like a, someone rubbed a bit of charcoal along the top. Beautiful orange gills. Typically, people would see these on the table and just, I see them called cinnamomious group, or quaternarius cinnamomious. So with these domasibi, I can't, I can't expect anyone, I don't expect myself to put names on them yet, but these are a great target for us to start to sequence and collect um, and start to notice different features, the color of the veil, the reaction in KOH, the reaction to UV, and do they have sort of a different color veil for girls? Like in this one, all of these three have this dark charcoal-like look on the cap. Uh, my only hope is to inspire some of you here to do something other than dye with them, because they uh, the only people who seem to collect them in abundance are dyers who love them for their um, the pigments that they produce for, for wools and natural products. Don't get any ideas. Um, now, we're almost running to the end of groups. I've got a few more groups for those who want to occur, you know, sort of chunk out areas. This is called a leprosity. And leprosity is one of the success stories or my hopeful stories that I'm going to bring you today because a recent paper has been produced in the last few years, which has named a number of new Northwestern American species and has also given us a really nice key. So looking at the leprosity, what you're going to see in common is they are UV positive. They often, if you shine your UV light, you'll see a lovely reaction. And the cap has this finely scaly tomentose um, texture. The pileus is, is really quite unique. Often they'll have yellow or pallid yellowish tones, um, particularly on the girls. And here you've got, well, you've got five. I, I was a bit optimistic with 10. You've got five species known from California. And I typically have only seen one of those names, sometimes two, um, used with any frequency. Portinarius clandestinus was the most well-known species. It's widespread, it tends to be a bit more fun, often found in spring. But you also have Cortinarius fuscotomentosus, Ultrospomosis, fuscoflavidus. Uh, Dimitar was involved in some of this work, and he also found Cortinarius AFF Cortonius, as yet undescribed. That's, uh, he, he's the, I believe, is the only collector of that species. So again, you have options here and you have a wonderful key. Um, this paper and all the other papers I'm referencing, I've actually put up on my website and I'll share the link with you afterwards. And I encourage anyone who would like to sort of work on or start to ID quotes to download these keys because they're quite simple. Um, and because they're Northeast and Northwest, you pretty quickly narrow down to a smaller list of species. Uh, here's one I learned after the paper, Cortinarius fascotomentosus. I kind of fell on this one as I got lost in the forest and I was late for the carpool. I had to stop and photograph it. 
it's absolutely gorgeous and it has a, a wonderful yellow UV reaction. Um, leprosity, again, is this group. Another one, atrospinosis. This is my collection. It's affiliated to a known species. Um, and this one was just found. I, you know, I just managed to sequence this one because I was doing um, mycota found of uh, mycophora. Um, another group, glycopodes. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail. But glycopus is another big group that you can start to identify. It has bulbous stipe, viscid cap, um, and these purple to brownish colors. So. This, these can be extremely common and abundant in forests, you know, in sort of mid to late fall. There are five species that occur in this area of the glycopoids. Um, and then there's some related species on the right. Um, we have glycocephalus and albessens, which is, Noah says, smells like green corn. I think it's really strangely um, bitter. Um, and then another species of glycopus on the bottom. But just to get a feeling, look at the sort of relationships and this kind of look and feel. Even if you're not going to be involved in identifying all cotton areas, it could be a good idea just to pick the glycopoids or to pick a section like this. There's a ton of work to do, and there are many species that will get to be discovered. And then the last group that I'm going to talk about is what I call the little, the little gray mice, the anomaly. Another fabulous place to start because an excellent paper has come out identifying our species and providing a robust key. If you look at these, you start to just sort of imagine you've had a glass of wine, you're kicking back, you start to see a pattern. They've got this gray, purple, slightly mousy colors, often quite slender stipes, pale. Um, and so I, I call them a little gray mice. And you have at least six species known from California. Uh, again, these are names out there, well described, supported by a key. So there's nothing complicated about identifying these anomalies. So once again, we start to look at this kind of look and feel, just enough to say, huh, I think this is an anomaly. And then you have a really good key that you can use to, um, to get to species in, in most of our collections. And if you're not, you know, by all means, keep that specimen because there's still a great deal of work to do. Here's one of the more common ones that we see in our area. Um, and you know, there's there's many others, but this one is probably the more more common. And you're seeing it's very densely. Um, the veil is quite dense. It's got a lot of white sort of um, cottony fibers on the stipe. And if you look at where the, the edge of the stipe joins to the cap, there's often a lot of white white kind of cottony material. And I'm gonna know the ladies. And and then of course this is just to tell you don't go too far because. <laughs> So the, the last group that I'm going to mention today is the Telemonia. And the Telemonia are a vast group of Cortinarius, and it's probably why Cortinarius has got a bad reputation. In the paper on Cortinarius uh, Telemonia, there were 80 sections with over 800 species, I believe. I didn't count, so you might, uh, might have to check me on that. But 800, and they all are some tone of brown. Beautiful, subtle tones of brown. Um, but you do need to have a certain degree of fervor to really want to name species in Telemonia or at least without sequencing. Um, I'm very committed to collecting them because you know, these are areas that, you know, because they're brown and multitudinous, um, they have been under collected, but I think that they're most worth collecting if you're actually going to take specimens, have them sequenced and sort of really build up our genetic um, data set on these before we try and put names to them. Um, that said, I just sequenced, uh, sent these into my coda from Southern California, and almost all of the species that I collected were new. Uh, in other words, the first record in genetic data sets. These are from the Las Osas Oaks. Uh, I was very lucky Michelle Torres Grant showed me around on there. Um, you know, really, really interesting um, to understand, you know, the range of diversity that we have in, in town. Only. Here is an example from the paper, Mission Impossible, aptly named where you see one photograph represents a section, and I couldn't fit them all on the page. So each of these is backed by a number, um, kind of multiple, sometimes dozens of species. I'm just gonna pause for dramatic effect here. So, you know, that, we, we're going beyond the 101. This is now the, the level four, you've sort of jumped ahead. Um, but, you know, where, where do you go? I, I started to mention sequencing and, Certainly, I would recommend um, 
Cotton areas is one of the best genera or areas to work if you are interested in sequencing because we've got a very strong phylogenetic backbone that's been established by workers around the world, sequencing types. These are all papers that have contributed to the foundation of what we know in Cotton areas. Um, I can keep adding in this <laughs> just a small section. Each of these papers has, has involved you know, intense work going to a barrier, collecting types, sequencing really old types and developing methods to do so, um, developing epitypes, global collaboration to understand whether our species are the same or different to Europe, and Emma Harrow was involved in some of that early work. Um, and that, that body of data is really unparalleled across many genera. I mean, there are few genera, particularly of this size, that have that kind of framework in place that enables us to build out and know what is new. So imagine if you had a guidebook of birds and they're all named SPA 1, SPA 2. If you find SPA 55, how do you know? There's no, there's no well, good foundation for you to know um, whether or not your thing is the same as something that's new already. Um, people, you know, many people have gone back to look at type descriptions, but they're often quite thin. And so it's been difficult to know whether one brown quaternarius described 100 years ago is the same or different to your species that you're finding in the different continent. The genetic data has helped sort of break that logjam. And we've had, you know, all of these keys and groups redefined over the last 20, 30 years. Most recently, there's been a proposal published in this paper, Taming the Beast. I don't know what I feel about these heroic names, but Taming the Beast, um, which proposes a new breakdown of Cortinarius, of the Cortinariaceae, and divides them into 10 genera. Uh, so any of you who have you know, been close to Belit ID will have seen this process happen in Belit, in Anosibi. And the proposal for the Quaternary ACA today is, is a proposal possibly in process, um, but currently proposes 10 genera, not all of which are in the US. I think seven or eight have species in, in uh, the North America. And this pie chart on the right shows, if you took the pie chart of every single known you know, known species of Quaternarius that were involved in the study, how many would go to each of these genera, these new proposed genera? You can see the biggest part of the pie, a good three quarters of the pizza, would remain in genus Quaternarius, um, followed by the big slices go to Thaxterogaster, Lignatium, Calinarius, and a few little slices. So if you remember back to early on when I was saying think about groups, one of the groups or some of the groups that I mentioned there have actually been elevated to genus. So Phlegmacia was one of them. Um, the others not, but you'll see them maybe at the subgenus level. So the, think about the, the pie as being divided into big slices, and then you have smaller groups within those, um, each of those genera. So let's look at you know, what this sort of means um, for those of us looking at identification codes. So on the left are some of the proposed groups that we used to have as subgenera, or in fact, in some cases, had been proposed to be top level genera in the past. Uh, Cortinarius, remember, Mixacium was the one that had the viscid cap and the viscid stipe. Uh, the Telemonia, the brown multitudes. The Masibi, remember the bright colored cap and the bright gills that you could dye. Um, and Bulbopodium, I didn't use that name much, but it's got a really abrupt, beautiful big bulbum in the stipe. So think of it like a turnip with a stipe growing out of it. So you had these old ideas of subgenera that were often used in ID books. In the new proposal, each of those subgenera, well, not those subgenera, but the subgenera are elevated to become gene genera in their own right. Um, so we would now have genus Thygmacium, genus Cortinarius, genus Thaxterogaster. Um, and under each, you'll see some of the familiar sections like the anomaly, the little gray mice, or um, leprosity, those now fall under the genus as subgenera. So let's, let's have a, just a look, and you can judge for yourselves if this is going to help or hinder you in your identification or understanding. So here's one of the subgenera, Orionarius. So I've just pulled all my photographs of Orionarius and shown how it's divided. You see on the left, there's the genus, Orionarius. And then it's divided into two subgenera, Philisti and Orionarius. Um, and Paul Kruger's mushroom is actually in here, Orionarius krogeri on the bottom right. It's been shifted from genus Quaternarius to genus Orionarius. So my first impression on looking at this is 
there's something that helps me here, right? This genus hangs together. They have a certain look. They have a slightly glabrous cap. They have orange-yellow tones on the cap, often, you know, some distinction with the stipe. Um, and if we look at the, you know, the, the microscopy and other morphological characteristics, it makes sense. In a sense, I am more easily able to place these mushrooms by having this concept. Whether it needed to be at the genus level or not, not making a decision right now. But as a group, this makes sense to me. Um, and in fact, these genera, by the way, are already starting to appear on iNaturalist. So when you need to search for all cortinarias in an area, you now have to search cortinariaceae because many are, have already been transferred to, say, in this case, genus Phlegmaceae. Here's another one. So cystinarius is another of the genera. They're medium to large, and you might recognize rubicundulus, Fortinarius rubicundulus from uh, this. Fortinarius rubicundulus um, now is Fortinarius rubiginosus and has been transferred to Cystinarius. So these names will now be changed to Cystinarius rubiginosus, Cystinarius rubicundulus. Um, distinctive, some of many of them stain yellow. They have cystidia, if you enter microscopy, quite small spores. So, you know, for me, this, again, I can see commonalities. This is a small genus, and the, the species within it, the taxa within it, you know, do add to a homogenous concept to some degree. The story is not as easy in Cortinarius. So currently, Cortinarius, the things that are left in three quarters of the pizza, are really too helpful. It's too broad to help. Um, there are so many genera and subgenera. Um, there's a wide range of colors. And here's an example. So all of these species are still in genus Portinarius. You can see the one on the left is Mixaceoid. It is highly viscous on the cap and stipe. Um, that's uh, Portinarius brunis, Brunio albus. I can't see, this not Yeah, Brunio albus. And then we have a leprosobe. Remember those scaly caps with go UV yellow. Um, this is a spa. I wasn't able to identify it. And then the third is a demosobe. Uh, related to, we're calling it related to aminosis. All of these are subgenera that currently are in genus Cortinarius. So for Cortinarius, I would recommend that you start at the subgenera, um, the subgenus level, and you find a lot more coherence in the species, in the species groups. So start to recognize demosity, prosody, mixasium. Don't try and just identify everything in Cortinarius um, genus. Here's one of the other genera, and I'm just walking you through a few of these um, before I wrap up. So Phlegmacium, this is a new genus. Um, remember uh, you saw Ponderosus? That's being transferred now to Phlegmacium, and so the name has changed. Um, now, I won't remember it on the fly, but I know that Elsa could transfer it basically because the Phlegmacium is a different gender to Cortinarius, the name has had to change. So you'll probably see um, Cortinarius ponderosus also appearing as phlegmacium. Um, they, it includes the glaucopides, the glaucopus. Remember I showed you and mentioned how these mushrooms need a lot of work, but also Bulbopodium um, and other sort of species like albescens that have this sort of stature, often pale, grayish, white to purple. Um, the stipe is often gray, they're quite robust. And they might have, um, you know, the large sort of bulbous uh, base to the stem. But this is not exclusive enough for me to eliminate some species that are in other genera. So you have to continue to have a sort of broader view to, to get to them. Um, another new genus is Calinarius, um, one of the most beautiful genera. And this contains some of the most beautiful Portinarius globally. Um, they are often brightly colored and have a marginate bulb, this really abrupt bulb, and bright KOH reactions. What makes these particularly exciting is that many of them are very small um, ecological niche and um, can be quite varied and indicators of sort of very small, somewhat endangered habitats. So many are on the ICU and red lists. Um, I'm afraid that I don't know as many as I'd like because I've primarily hunted in areas that are not oak habitat, and there are many of these in oaks. Uh, but those of you who get out into oak habitat, these are among the most beautiful areas, and we certainly need to do a lot of work with them. Uh, so Calinarius, they used to be called the Calicroid um, species within genus Portinarius. 
And if you remember, this was the purple one I showed you to discriminate against a bluet. Again, just look at that beautiful um, rusty brown cortina, the KOH that you're seeing on the bottom left in that margin. Here's another calicoid. This is um, Flaviponius. Oops, lost it. Um, this one is also from the Los Osos Oaks, and it's related to um, Flavipalums. It's, we'll have to investigate and see if it's a known species or not. Genus Thaxterogaster. Um, again, it has a certain look and feel, this brown cap and pale stipe. Much smaller than uh, Cortinarius, but still a really sizable group. And it includes mushrooms that would have we used to think were Mixacium, particularly the Vibratiles, which are these very slender little viscid ports that you can lick. They're extremely bitter. It's a very good um, little test for people as they're taking an ID walk. You just lick them, people will have a very strong uh, memory of what that species is, Cortinarius Vibratiles. So I'm I gave you a very quick blitz through, lastly, with, with genus Baxterogaster. But where do we go from here? And um, you probably or hopefully got a sense of the large scope of Cortinarius and a few ideas of how you can have some entry level into the most memorable species and groups. But there's a lot of work to do. Um, and I'm really encouraging people, I'm hopeful that we can build up the United, the US or the North American understanding of these species by filling in some of the gaps across habitats and areas that have been poorly collected to really understand what we have um, in our area. How many cotton areas exist here? And what is the relationship across the continent? So there is this opportunity to do the continental micro blitz this fall. Uh, the, the project is advertised um, online. You can also join it on iNaturalist. And anyone who participates and collects vouchers and joins the project can submit 10, sequence, 10 collections for sequencing free. Uh, bonus if you make those cotton areas, they are a uh, species of interest, genera of interest. Um, also, I know that there's California sequencing efforts going on with microflora. Um, I'm sure there's somebody here who could tell you more about that. Also, really valuable initiative to understand uh, the microflora of California. Uh, in conclusion, I know this works. I was able to describe this new species, cotton areas rufo sanguineus simply because I had access to sequencing at a lower price that was sponsored and supported by these sort of microflora projects. And I also had support from other people who happened to collect in the 2019 microflora project. That gave me two additional collections outside of my tech location um, and enough variety for me to feel confident that I could describe a new species with help from Joanna Wadi and others. So, um, you know, just here calling up, this is what it looked like. I found this collection online, the person who put the barcode up, they collected it uh, in, in far north of me in Alaska, and this actually became part of the paper describing the species. So real evidence, I've experienced firsthand the value of the community science contributions and how we can kind of collaborate to really build up our understanding of where things are and what they're. Um, another one of Jennifer um, also had one of these collections up in June. So my website here, just a pitch, I haven't been putting new stuff on, but I will be. It's called nacourts.com and I put up sequenced photographs. So you know that this is actually what it is. Um, many guidebooks don't sequence the photographs and almost all of them have misidentified courts. Um, I also have a resources section there that um, has the, a link to Google Drive and will help you get some of these papers if you want to follow keys. And if it's not up to date, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, I'm always happy to help and provide you with literature. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> would you prefer that people submit questions in the chat and you work your way down? Or are you down with people raising their hand? Um, you know, whatever you suggest, Nancy. I don't see the chat now, but I'm going to go looking for it. I, I think the chat would probably be the most organized way to go because I'm working on um, a computer the size of a cell phone right now, so I can't oh. see everybody to unmute them or whatever. Um, so let's open chat. it up for, um, you see the chat now? You're good? Yeah, I just wrote questions here and hopefully that I have some or I haven't stunned everybody. Perfect. Um, so everybody, yeah, please submit your questions via chat. <clears throat> Personally, I, I thought this was a fabulous talk. 
Um, I've been afraid of Cortinarius. Um, I've seen a few. You busted some myths for me. I always assumed they had to have the, the webby um, veil, but now I know different. Um, I didn't know they're credible. I, I had no idea. Yeah. Interesting that that was some of them are, right? Some of them are, some of them are. And I, you know, in Europe, they, they do eat Cortinarius prey stems. I had a friend who went over and took me photographs of a market full of Cortinarius prey stems. You know, I've heard it can be you know, a, a bit rare in areas. But people, you know, people often tell me, look, we tell people that they don't always have the Cortina because apparently after the first talk, somebody had a great disappointment and they were tricked, skunked, because the mushroom didn't have a Cortina. So Shannon, you didn't like the uh, uh, Caparatus? You know, I'm weird because to be very honest, this is the secret that's going to be public now. I have no sense of smell. I lost it like 10 years ago. So I probably am not a typical, um, I don't have a typical palate, but mm -hmm. I the taste much more than the odor. And I found it really petrochemical twice. I ate it in the Interesting. Night. But, uh, you know, anyone else here? Um, no, no choice edibles, Curtis, no. Um, unless, I mean, some people love Cortinarius caparatus. I've had friends fill their baskets and batter them. And, yeah, depends what else is on. Yeah, well, I, I like them very much. And uh, I I know people that have said they actually like the uh, uh, ponderosas, and I've tried that. That's very metallic to me. It it starts out okay, and then I get hit with this big metallic flavor that that's not very enjoyable. Someday they'll understand how our noses work. Um, <laughs> explain why some people get such different different um, tastes. So I did hear, I have a question here from Mayumi saying, I mean, she's a dyer, interested in Damasibi, do they, will they all die? Well, I have not tried to dye them all because, you know, it's like I don't kind of die with my food or die with my babies. But I do, um, the, all the ones I have tried have had um, pigment. And I'm, I'm wondering if there are other pigment uh, fabric dyers on, on the on pole, maybe they can um, chip in. You don't need to know the species to dye from. It's pretty visible. The red, they pretty much make the color that you're seeing on the gills. So the dark red, foundation's red, foundation's red, um, it can be really beautiful. Um, I'm not sure if this talk is recorded, uh, Natalie. Sorry, I was muted. Uh, it is recorded and it'll be posted, um, I think on our YouTube channel, Maria, is that right? Um, it will be on our YouTube, uh, and you can find the link on the MSSF uh, page. Yeah, and I would love to, you know, give me a year, and I think I'm happy to come back and do a deeper dive on some of the, you know, the new genera. Because uh, my thing, I've made myself a big X mind, a mind map that explodes out um, and shows all the photographs. And I think we're going to need to, as field mycologists or people who are interested in, you know, personally identifying rather than just relying on genetics, uh, we're going to need to get a, a bit of time to sort of understand where those groups that can be identified morphologically and keyed up and where it's still, you know, too varied um, or too, you know, microscopic um, or maybe even cryptic. Thank you, Joe. Um, anyone here uh, sort of interested or has been collecting Cortinarius, um, taking photographs of them? Yes, I'm seeing two nods. Uh, Andy, I know Andy has been. Yeah, but really there is just, um, what, one of the most interesting things is how th there's a delay between academic papers and what we know as a mushrooming community. And, you know, I would love to shorten that delay, um, you know, and sort of get the information out from papers more quickly. For example, I was told, as I told you, for, for a decade, you can't look at my, uh, mushroom groups in Portland areas because someone studied and found they're not natural. But, you know, when you think about it, we don't have to follow that. It's still very helpful for us to be able to sort of get concepts, even if we're finding that there are cryptic, you know, species that have developed in parallel morphology. So vicidity, vicid caps have uh, maybe developed in multiple genera. I don't think that should limit us from looking at vicid caps. 
Uh, so that's kind of example. I think we need to read the literature, learn the new names that are coming out, and you know, continue to sort of take what's useful from them and maybe park some, uh, wait a little longer for some of these new proposed genera, because they can be kind of, um, you know, there can be kind of a lot if you're not already in this, in this sort of embedded in thoughts. Yes, Fred, I will, I will post the anomaly key, I will post the leprosomy key, and I'll be incredibly happy. And my talk will have been a success if anybody keys out anomaly and leprosomy in California. Hmm. Um, yeah, I will post, let me just see if I can, um, if you go to my website is, and I think there's a resources, oops, I think I've messaged. <clears throat> Everybody, just pasting a link. Um, this will remind me to put more of my photographs up there. But as somebody asked, is I naturalist keeping up with the genome? Piecemeal. That's the problem. So half of the of a species, half of a taxa will be in the one name and half in the other. So sometimes late at night, I'll try and transfer them all manually, which is not uh, an efficient approach. So maybe somebody who has connections to iNaturalist can ask if they do one or the other. Um. So we have lots of new species to describe. Um, so, you know, again, if anybody collects them, are you guys planning to participate in any of the sequencing efforts this year? We as a club don't have an official plan, but I think individuals will be participating. It can be. I'm, tr I'm trying to, um, I just, PSMS, I've just asked if PSMS will sponsor um, uh, you know, just make it official for the week or two in fall. That is our season. And if you do, you know, join in, it can be nice to form a committee. I promised them a pizza party where they are, particularly people who, <laughs> who collect uh, Cortinarius. And then we'll learn together how to take a little bit of tissue from the, the fresh specimen and put it in a little tube um, to make it really more affordable to sequence. Um, so I'm really hoping that will be a, a kind of a practice because honestly, I don't know how to do it properly yet. Um, I see Guy says he's in the Sierra foothills and finds lots of courts. That's excellent news. Because um, I know the Sierra foothills, I don't think they always are fruiting and I haven't ever collected there. So, yeah, so let's, um, I would just, just, Guy, I would love to follow you on iNaturalist and, um, you know, see what you're finding. I have been known to jump on an airplane if there's, if there's a lot out. If it's, um, I have a remote work option, so sometimes the manager finds that I'm suddenly in a mysterious place with mushrooms. And um, I would love to see what you find. I bet that there's a lot of new stuff to learn out there. Fingerprinting. Ah, okay. I will reach out. Thank you. Yeah, and anyone I, I missed earlier. Where, where are you um, located now? I'm in Seattle. Um, okay. I travel quite a lot for mushrooms. So this year I'm going to be going to Alaska to go to the Girdwood Fungus Fed uh, Festival at the end of summer and um, be collecting there for that week. Um, it's the northernmost kind of cascade rainforest. And I find that it's very interesting because we're finding some species there that are transarboreal connecting to Europe um, that we don't see further down. So it's like the, it's a, a connective zone um, so I, I get to see different species plus birch, uh, which we have, you know, relatively little birch down here in Washington. Uh, that's, that's, and I'm also participating in uh, our Pacific Northwest forays. We have a, a, a few um, seasonal forays, mainly October and early November. But um, mainly, mainly in Washington. I will be very inspired if we see more courts. I, I've asked Stephen Russell and the locals, like, what genera are you prioritizing in your, micro, you know, in your collections? And they tell me Inosibi, uh, Cortinarius, Russula, um, and a few others like that. So I'm always excited if Cortinarius is up there. And you know, really, when I asked Stephen Russell what percentage of 
output narratives are new to genetic databases in every batch. It's over 10%, one in 10 of the collections that he's taking. In fact, it's a bit higher, but we were conservative in on that. Uh, wow, that's amazing. Databases. So maybe you know, private collectors, professionals may have it in their, Dimitar may have it, but um, it's, it's, you know, there's a really a low threshold for finding net new um, data. Curtis, I think we mean genetic fingerprinting, like I, I, I interpreted that as barcoding. There's a question about fingerprinting. <laughs> I think it's genetic fingerprinting. <laughs> Not like the mushrooms or criminals that have been arrested. <laughs> yeah, catch anyone with the cotton areas and fingerprints. Yeah, um, I am. I am occasionally feeling the sort of the, the 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 envy of Europe. I mean, here in North America, we have so much more novelty in our fungi, so much more to learn. But I do feel envy towards Europe because they have a cotton areas conference. It's called. Uh, it meets with people from across Europe, and they all come on and, and they all meet up every year in one country in Europe with their microscopes and all of them, 100% of them are studying cotton areas. So um, occasionally at late at night, I do think, oh, maybe we should have a North American cotton areas conference in an Airbnb somewhere. So, you know, become known and we can go out there and have some wickedness. Does anybody else have a question for our fabulous speaker? <laughs> or would you like to express a little gratitude like me? I'm grateful you're here. I loved your talk. I'm glad I opened my eyes a little bit. I didn't want people to fall asleep. They did in one of my talks. <laughs> well, it was a wonderful talk, and thank you very much for coming. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, thank you. Okay. All right, everybody. Well, have a good night. And thank you again, Shannon. Thank you, everyone. I hope to follow up with many of you. Okay. Good night, everyone. Okay.